Good evening. It's Monday, September the 16th. We're in the governor's room in the community center, and this is the St. Peter uh, School Board meeting. Uh, and I'd like to call the meeting to order. To do so, we would consider and adopt the agendas before us. So moved. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries, and the agenda is adopted. Would you please stand and join me in the pledge of allegiance? to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As per our habit, as we go through our agenda this evening, if there is a member of our audience that wishes to speak to a particular item, there are cards in the back that you can fill out with your question and to get them to Miss Sarah on the corner. Uh, when we get to that agenda item, we'll allow you time and opportunity to speak to those agenda items. Uh, next thing we have tonight is our consent agenda. Uh, we will, I will read through the consent agenda. If anyone finds an individual item they wish to deal with at the end, we can pull it out or a motion to approve will be in order. Tonight, in our consent agenda, we are approving the regular board meeting minutes of August the 19th, 2019. We are approving bills of $2,252,863.72 and wire transfers of $2,458,841.05 for August of 2019. Mr. Chair, uh, the bills are all in order and up to date. Thank you. Treasurer. Uh, we have a number of personnel items, which is pretty normal for uh, the first few months of the year. We are this evening approving of an increase in hours from 6.5 to 6.75 hours a day for the St. Peter Middle School paraprofessional. This increase is due to an afternoon guard crossing assignment. We are approving a maternity leave for a teacher at St. Peter High School from September 16, 2019 until November 27, 2019. We are approving a maternity leave for a teacher at St. Peter Middle School from September 23, 2019 until November 11, 2019. We are accepting the resignation of an ELA teacher at St. Peter Middle School. We are approving the hiring of a night custodial engineer at St. Peter Middle School August 23, 2019. This is a replacement position. We are approving the hiring of a part-time school nurse for the 2019-20 school year. This is a replacement position. We are approving an increase in hours from 4.75 to 6.5 hours a day for an ECSE paraprofessional. This increase is serving as a replacement. We are approving the hiring of an ECSE paraprofessional for the 2019-20 school year. This is a replacement position. We are approving the hiring of an ECSE paraprofessional for the 2019-20 school year. This is also a replacement position. We are approving the hiring of a special education paraprofessional at South Elementary for the 2019-20 school, school year. This is also a replacement position. We are approving the hiring of a special education paraprofessional at South Elementary for the 2019 and 20 year. This is, one. This is also a replacement position. Uh, the approval of a hiring of a special education paraprofessional at South Elementary for the 3. Uh, for the 2019 20 school year, this is a replacement position. We are accepting the resignation of a special education paraprofessional at North Elementary effective August 20th. 2019. We're accepting the resignation of a 2000. Uh, accepting the resignation of a special education paraprofessional at St. Peter Middle School, effective August 28, 2019. We are approving the hiring of a special education paraprofessional at St. Peter Middle School for the 2019-20 school year. This is a replacement position. We are approving the hiring of a special education paraprofessional at St. Peter High School. For the 2019-20 school year, this is a replacement position. We are approving the hiring of a special education paraprofessional at St. Peter High School 
for the 2019-20 school year. This is a replacement position. We are approving the termination of a special education paraprofessional at North Elementary, effective September 9, 2019. We are hiring, we are approving the hiring of a special education paraprofessional at Sanford Middle School for the 2019-20 school year. This is a replacement position. We are approving a maternity leave for a teacher at St. Peter High School from December 6, 2019 through February 18, 2020. We are approving the hiring of a .66 English, English Language Arts teacher at St. Peter Middle School for the 2019-20 school year. This is a replacement position. We are approval approving the increase in hours from 6.5 to 6.75 hours a day for four St. Peter Middle School paraprofessionals retroactive to the beginning of school. This increase is to accommodate their morning special duty, special education bus duty assignments. We are approving the hiring of an additional coaches due to increased athletic participation in girls soccer, boys soccer, and girls longer. And lastly, we are declaring of equipment as obsolete due to non-working order and no longer useful or no longer needed as part of the physical education curriculum. A list of these items has been included in your packet. And that is the consent agenda for this evening. If there are no individual items, uh, uh, motion to approve the email. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. I have a motion to second any further discussion or comments. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And the motion carries consent agenda is approved. Thankfully, the student spotlight for the student missing the dinner. I know. Of course, like every month, I tell you, these student council kids are the busiest ones in the building, so. Um, we have one out of two of our co-presidents here tonight to introduce to you. Alex Bocanegra is with us tonight. Uh, Isabel Lind is the other representative, so hopefully with, with um, two of them, we'll be able to make it to a few board meetings this year. Um, but I, I'm pleased to introduce Alex to you. Her parents, she's the daughter of Concepcion and Jose Bocanegra. Um, and I'll let her talk about some of her activities and interests and classes and then maybe follow it up with, with just a, a brief report from the student council. Sweet. So yeah, my name is Alice Kupinger. I'm currently a senior at Senior High School. Um, I'm both student council president with Easy Lynn. Um, so some things that I'm involved in, I am the varsity volleyball manager for the third year now. And um, I, through um, the high school CNA program, Last spring, I have become the CNA now. Um, and along with that, I hope that I will attend MSU and in a nursing classes and then go up. Yeah. And then, so now, some things that we are doing for Indian Student Council is planning for homecoming. Um, so, some things that we have right now are we're planning our carnival, which, so homecoming is October 4th. And we have set up slides on the TV screens at the school to um, show the, the homecoming shirts that we're selling this year. Um, and then also we are, um, what we just um, announced candidates so right now we're currently planning with them how the homecoming parade will work and the videos that they will be doing and working with them to see how we can incorporate teachers into their <laughs> and so, um, currently we're playing the <coughs> October 4th, this set of prayer early week schedule, but like, after classes are done, we have a carnival, a campus and a carnival. So, we are currently working through what games we can involve and how we, like, how we get teachers and other students from the audience involved into our games during the campus with the candidates and um, decorating for homecoming that week. Um, along with figuring out how to make um, like a URL to send out to the student body so that they have the choice in what dress up days they want and um, like a what theme and what kind of dance they would like to see. Um, and really just figuring out how to get not just like, the student council members involved in planning and learning, but also the whole student body. And not just the homecoming, but also in um, decorating at the school and different like, pet fests that we have and just our dress up the ideas. 
ending on a nursing career in the ISPEC Medical Science Academy just made you think, yep, that's really what you wanted to do, or did you take that sequence of courses trying to find out if that's what you wanted? Yeah, so I took the ISPEC course, like, having an idea that I wanted to be nursing, but not quite knowing where I wanted to be in the health science field. Okay. And so ISPEC really, like, brought in that you don't just have to be a nurse at the ER or something. QComp are the other items that have changed a little bit from last year, either up or down, um, to, to kind of change, you know, things change. Another big driver of the levy amount is enrollments. Um, as enrollments go up or down, the levy goes up or down. Um, the more enrollment you have, obviously, the higher the levy becomes because of the number of students there, and that changes a lot of formulas. Um, pretty much most of the 40 items they, they're calculated on uh, you know, how many enrollments you have or things like that, and they go through a formula. Um, and one thing to remember with the levy, a lot of the levy, you know, the, obviously the $6 million comes from the local taxpayers, but we do receive a lot of aid through the levy too. It's equalized by the state, and that's a complicated formula depending upon students and your tax values. Um, I guess basically, you know, page two, um, and went over this extensively, hopefully, at the Finance Committee last week. The, the difference in the levies um, from last year, we showed like the last three-year levies and then the preliminary from this year and kind of the difference. 
And as you can see on the bottom right now, the difference is about $5,000 or 0.8%. So it's, it's basically no change from last year. Um, and then the third page is just kind of an update on some of the market values that have done in the, the St. Peter School District as far as market values, referendum values, um, tax capacities, and those type of items that drive a lot of the calculations for, for this. Um, and you can kind of see a little bit of history on the levy as far as we go there. Um, I guess what we were recommending to do is to, to, um, to recommend the maximum or certify the maximum. What we'll do is certify the maximum, and what that do, does then is basically drives the tax statements that are produced, the preliminary ones that the, the tax owners will get in November. And then between now and our December meeting, we'll work on with the Finance Committee in finalizing the, the final levy amounts. Just a couple of oh, quick comments. I think one of the things we always need to remember with the levy is it's, it's a levy 19, pay 20 for fiscal year 21. So it's back up, it pushes us back into the 2021 school year before you're actually receiving the levy money. But we think it's important to at least have the option to consider things like that career and technical education levy. We certainly are, and you'll see this later on in the agenda, making some very concerted efforts to strengthen that career and technical education program and the offerings we have and the equipment we have in that program. So uh, I, th I think I wanted to note that. The other one, this is a little bit of a soapbox for me, but the long-term facility maintenance levy with the age and condition of buildings is illogical. Uh, so what happens is we build a new high school, we still have all of our other buildings exactly the same, and our levy ability drops because the age, average age of our buildings goes down. down. So it doesn't make any sense. If, if you would decommission a building, uh, that would be one thing. But we still have exactly the same needs as we had before. So it's like that's one we might want to think about is in terms of our legislative advocacy coming up here uh, on this next legislative session. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, just to go ahead, summarize Matt. a little bit, we're talking. You're getting your figures from the state. They're they're telling you what the numbers are in essence, or what the equations are. What yeah, the maximums yeah. can be there. We have some you know variability in amounts we can put in or, or levy. Um, and then you can always, as a board or a, you know, as a district, come in less on some of some of them. But the maximums they're giving us what they are, and they, they're long, complicated equations that that change it. Yeah. And we're talking local tax dollars, but again, the state, in recognition of those, is uh, is putting money into that. So those local tax dollars are buying more state aid. So it's a good investment for the community that way. Correct. A lot of a lot of the numbers that if you don't levy for it, you don't get the corresponding aid with it. So, you know, I, I don't want to say it's a one to one thing. Like LTFM, I guess is a good example. That is actually one, pretty much one to one based on us. You know, our levy is four hundred and some thousand dollars, and we get an additional four hundred thousand dollars in aid to you know to use. So, and even by um, if we do um, vote to uh, consider the maximum. We can change it later down. You can you can't change it up, right. and even by um, certifying the the maximum, we're not talking about a large tax increase at all. No, no, minimal. What 0.08 percent you yeah. have in this projection? Yeah. yeah, and like I said, that's what that'll adjust a little bit. It won't be that, but um, there'll probably be no changes. What what we will do? Um, kind of what what happens is, you know, the levy is actually like a 40-page document, and there's 300 schools. And I think sometimes that the, once, once they get out to the schools and they got out to the schools last Monday and the schools start looking at them and they say, hey, something's a little off here, and then they'll contact the state and the state will do an updated run. And by the time we're probably done with this, we'll have in the teens of updates. Um, some will affect us, so, some won't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're at four in the last week, so. Thank you. What was that percentage again? Uh, zero. Point zero eight is the well, so, max. Yeah. That's that's existing numbers. Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, I think one thing always that's good to uh, note is uh, the change in valuation uh, from one year to the other, and our district valuation this from last year to this year is increasing by about sixty uh, sixty one. Um, 
million, almost 62 million, and since uh, 14, so in the last six years, uh, it's gone up by $200 million. Uh, so that does affect um, how many dollars we run this across, whatever the mill rate is, uh, and that affects uh, the total dollars generated as well. So when market valuations go up, the mill rate can sometimes come down or stay flat and still generate more uh, dollars from one year to the next. And uh, I appreciate very much the work that the Finance Committee has done <coughs> working with you, Mr. Regner, to go through all of these options and everything to get us to a spot where we're looking at less than 1% uh, on the max um, for this year. So if does anyone else have questions or comments? If not, a motion to approve would be Move moved. to approve the max. Second. second. We have a motion and a second to approve the max. Further discussions? <coughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. And motion is approved. We will be talking about this every month between now and December. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next item we have tonight is to the uh, consider approval of the student representative and the alternate student representative to the school board, Ms. Engineer. And Alex, you're back up front. We're back. Again. You gotta get, Alex, you gotta get at least four votes. Okay. <laughs> you wanna start campaigning now? I think she did a nice job, right? She, she did. <laughs> Uh, yes, so every year uh, the board actually approves our student representatives um, as, as, as members of the board. Uh, they, can, they don't have, have voting options, um, but they, the board is always happy to take your input on anything that you might hear. Um, and next time you'll have a seat at the table by Ms. Hager. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and importantly, I think um, you're also eligible for some training uh, at the MSBA and I think if you can afford yourself of that, you should do it because it is a, it is a high quality training experience and um, it puts you on a similar plane to uh, other members. And it will be something that you will use later in life regardless of where you go or what you do. And when approved, make sure you put this on your resume. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So, um, motion to approve. I move to approve Alex and Izzy as student rep and alternate for the school year. Second. So and we have a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion approved. You're elected. Okay. There you go. Okay. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> um, next item we have tonight for our action is. Uh, consider the approval of plans to use AAA funds to support high school programs and facilities. Dr. Olson. So as you're aware, uh, the AAA campaign raised funds in a number of ways, but in one specific manner, there were funds generated uh, through uh, donations from individuals, sometimes classes, the class of 1963 for an example, uh, and they are result in those, uh, those plaques on the wall. The total amount generated through that uh, amount, through both in-kind contributions and cash contributions for just that specific part of the program is about $110,000. Of that amount, about $40,000 has been expended, so there's about $70,000 left in the AAA campaign. Uh, and through work with various committees that we've worked in at the facilities committee, the co-curricular committee, the gifts and donations committee, the finance committee, everybody sort of had an opportunity to take a look at how those funds might be spent. There were a number of ideas generated. And of those ideas, the two that surfaced were the uh, purchase of a CNC, the part of the purchase of a CNC plasma cutting system that could be used, Mrs. Engeldinger, in current technical education. Uh, sure, Mr. Reeser provided a nice write-up uh, for all of you about how the ways that he plans to use this machine. Um, but, but the plans are to use it as an interdisciplinary tool, not just in, the, in his 
his mechanics shop, but also uh, in our art program um, and our, our physics classes. Uh, some of that software is, is some pretty intense um, software for, for kids to learn. So, so across the board, I think this plasma cutting machine uh, will, will set our program apart from, from others in the area. Um, I don't know another, another high school program that has a machine like this right now. So we're pretty excited about the possibilities. Yeah. And, it, and it really will continue to spark interest in mm -hmm. the whole manufacturing academy idea mm -hmm. that, that is out there. Um, and then secondly, there are uh, some equipment for live broadcasting capabilities, I think for both the gymnasium and the performing arts centers. You want to yeah, correct. Actually, it's not just the, the performing arts center will be a, be a slightly different beast. Um, but two, uh, the brand name is Pixel Up, but there are two live motion sensor cameras that then um, provide a live um, feed to the internet. So as Dr. Olson always likes to say, in case he's up at his cabin, um, he can <laughs> still, still tune, in, tune in to what's going on on the, on the basketball court or on the football field. Um, so, so the quote that we have in here covers two of those along with computers uh, to, to run those and uh, installation and training. Uh, along with that, we also, this is the first year we've been able to run a digital media productions course. Um, so some of that additional equipment is, is there as well. Um, you know, we've got that beautiful studio off of the media center, uh, finally s seeing some use. Uh, it might look a little crazy in there now because they've got green screens up and two out of those three rooms um, and, and some nice lighting systems. But now that, now that it's a course, we actually know some of the equipment that, that will be required to really pull it off. And we think uh, in both of these there's an opportunity to to hit all three areas of mm -hmm. arts, athletics, and academics through uh, the expenditure of $30,000 of those funds. That still leaves a balance of $40,000 for uh, ongoing and future consideration. So I think it would be our recommendation and the recommendation of a number of all of the committees, and really with the Finance Committee being the last, that we move forward with approving the use of $30,000 in AAA funds to support those two items. We'll uh, I think the, fin uh, the facilities committee, our committee, was the first to see it, and as you said, it went through four committees. So I'd move uh, uh, approval of the uh, use of the AAA funds. Second. And we have a second. Um, is there not also some matching grant for that plasma? Yeah, uh, Mr. Reeser has connections with the um, American Welding Society uh, for possi possibility of a grant. Uh, right. It's not open yet. He plans to, to pursue that, we, which we have the ability to do now because as of last year, our students could actually earn a certain level of certification in welding in, in his program. Super. Mm -hmm. And we'll be able to live stream athletic mm -hmm. events. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, we have a motion and a second. Is there anything else? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those same sign. And the motion carries. Good luck. Thank you. Thank it's you. exciting. We'll be uh, moving forward tomorrow morning. Are we, uh, are we interviewing <laughs> for broadcasters now? Or, or is that are next week? <laughs> no. No, I'm not. <laughs> No. Look, Just wondering. Yeah, are we bringing I'm, I'm, back the student news? Because I'm, <laughs> I'm sure they're going to be banging the door down wanting yeah. to get the microphone. <laughs> student news. Yeah. Um, that completes our action items for the evening, and we're moving into uh, some information items. We have uh, five of those tonight, and we're starting with our North Star Accountability <coughs> Report. Welcome, Darren. Thank you, Board Chair uh, Carlsrud, members of the board. Uh, as you know, every year at this time, um, the uh, spring assessments have finished up, and uh, I put together a report along with the administrative team about uh, student achievement. So it's the annual report of student achievement. In your board packet tonight, I did include a section of uh, that report, and um, this has to do with the, the annual North Star report. Um, some years back, um, Minnesota put together teams of individuals um, across the state to identify a way uh, that we can support schools or identify schools for the successes they have that align with every student succeeds at, which is a federal um, law. 
Um, so the North Star uh, report was generated from that. Uh, every three years, um, uh, through the process of just gathering the data each three years, there's a designation year. And the year of 2018 was a designation year. So that was a, a year ago this last spring. And so our results from 2019 are, are included in this section of the report. And they only talk about the five data points that are included in this part of the report. And so there's three stages to this report. Uh, the first stage has um, data as far as achievement levels in math, reading, and then also um, results from access score, which is students' language acquisition. So basically, we're matched up against, you know, how is the rest of the state doing, um, or how we're doing versus the rest of the state in math, reading, and language acquisition. Uh, stage number two um, just takes a look at, excuse me, takes a look at progress. And that's the one we spent a little bit of time last year talking about, like, where are these numbers exactly coming from? Because what that is looking at is at students that took the MCA assessments last year, and then they compare last year's results to this year. And what they're trying to do is, are students growing? So are they improving based on the prior year score? So those would be, obviously, our fourth graders, because they, the first year that students take the MCA assessment is in third grade. And then every year after that, they're able to put a value together. And so they, uh, students earn points based on how many, whether they maintain um, achievement levels, meeting or exceeding, or they improve. They don't earn any points um, if they stay partially or not meeting, or they go backwards. Um, so there's some values in there that based on like what are, what are the number, what's the average number of points that a student may achieve across the school district that has at least a couple years of data with MCAs. And then, and then the last stage talks, or excuse me, also in stage number two is gradu our graduation rates, um, so our grads. And then the final stage has to do with consistent attendance across the district. All of these values um, are also calculated by building. And that's something different um, from our last accountability reporting that's, that was before the North Star report. And that, in those reports, it only calculated schools that were able to take advantage of uh, Title I funding. So now it's every school um, in every um, district, they actually get values and results. Um, most of it being obviously per pertinent to the, uh, the age of the students that are at that school building. So during our study session on uh, September 30th, we'll dig into these numbers a little bit more. Um, that'll break down um, all of our achievement based on uh, grades, uh, buildings, um, ACTs, all of the items that we are able to look through. Um, and we'll be able to field um, as many questions as you may have at that point as well. But we just wanted to make sure you're able to see um, the North Star report based on just last spring's test results. Questions for Mr. Doherty? I think the key point is that September 30th study session, the agenda item is the annual assessment report. So we'll get an opportunity to really dig into that in, in detail. You know, in, in many of the districts that I've been in in the last uh, five years, uh, they have a huge focus on graduation and attendance rate. And, you know, uh, you can look at all kinds of points of data, but um, kids got to be there to be successful. And if they're successful, they're going to graduate. So I think that's a good measure that you can see we're doing well in St. Peter. On. And I think those two things aren't necessarily true in many of the districts that we're in. So that's a good point. Thank you, sir. You're I'll welcome. see you in a little bit. Sounds good. Um, next up, uh, Dr. O, we have a review. We do this annually in September every year for uh, approved fundraising plans by site. And yeah. we, I shouldn't say we've done this forever, but we've certainly done it the last five years, yeah. where we try and articulate to the, the public at large what are the things that you could expect to participate in, if you so choose, um, that are related to the school district. Um, as John Carlson always reminds us, that doesn't mean that there aren't other things out there, um, but these are the ones that we know about. So if you would, I'd ask that the, the principals come forward that have these plans just to stand for any questions you might have. I think that they're fairly standard from year to year. Um, and it's per board policy, uh, fundraising efforts and projects that uh, has that component to have an annual uh, 
presentation of fundraising plans. So uh, if you want to just start, uh, you might uh, have Doreen and then Darren and then John and then Annette. Does anybody have any specific questions? Thanks for coming up, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. I could speak to a little, a little bit to the high schools. It being, you know, that used to be probably pages and pages prior to um, the formation of a boots booster club, um, which makes which makes our list, um, our fine arts, and and any of, of our um, academic programs that do any fundraising. I believe I, I can't remember how many fundraisers there are with the booster club. I know the card is out there. And the, the, yep, the the cards and the cards uh, had a we had great success from those. Um, we also do the big um, golf tournament and the um, booster bash. The booster bash booster. in the spring. Okay. Those and are the, one more. Those are the three biggies. Oh, and memberships. Don't forget memberships. Mm -hmm. Just to expand on what I mean, there are, there might be associations that aren't affiliated with the school district that may be soliciting for their particular activity correct so but yeah. the ones you have are listed are it's a short list and I, I appreciate that mm -hmm. okay. thank you thank you <clears throat> dr. Olson Report on student enrollment. I think it's always important to, to, to check in and report on how our enrollment is looking. Uh, and we had some budget or some enrollment numbers as of last Wednesday. They showed that we're up uh, in our K-12 enrollment, 59 students over what our budget projection is. And that's up even higher over our enrollment at the end of the school year. So that's really good news. We remember that every student generates about $7,000 in revenue in the district. So enrollment is a key driver in finance. Um, these numbers, I checked again today, we're still up 59 students. So that's a good thing. The, the sh there's a little bit of a shift in where those numbers actually are. So usually when you, you're in three weeks to, uh, or a little bit more into the school year, you can be fairly confident in where your numbers are at. So we're confident that we're up at uh, 59 students. That number is gonna vary jump down a bit, but nothing, uh, you know, barring any unforeseen circumstance that is uh, really unusual. And it's just a reminder when we look at enrollment that uh, later on this fall we're going to be uh, conducting a demographic study uh, to take a look at with the Hazel Reinhardt Consulting Group what uh, enrollment trends should possibly be or could possibly be over the next five, ten years. Uh, and at that same time we'll also be doing a housing and enrollment study. that will look at the types of housing that um, would be essential or necessary in the St. Peter School District to continue to attract families with young children. So this is really good news. You don't want to be going the other direction on enrollment uh, because then you've got your, your problems compounded in terms of your budget. So this is a good report to get uh, and we're happy with our enrollment numbers. Questions or comments from you? We show um, K-12, 2,197 kids, um, and then there's a formula that they use to come up with how many pupil units that is and yeah. all that other stuff. But, um, so, nice. And, and as part of the report, sometimes people, there have been a question sometimes, why early childhood special education students in the count and not school readiness students, uh, students that are involved in early childhood family education. The reason for that is those early childhood special education students generate a portion of a weighted average daily membership. So we, uh, we get revenue based on that. So that's why we track that number as well. That number, uh, as you see from the report last week, was 58. Today the number is 65. So the numbers will continue to go up. At the end of the year last year, we were serving with slightly over 100 students. And I think, Mrs. Prafke, that's, that's due to to screening and identification of students with needs and, and then those students get involved in our program. We certainly have the capacity to serve that number. Thank you. Something that we do watch on a regular basis and uh, we'll continue to bring back to the public. Um, 
Next information item we have tonight is the first reading of Chapter 3. Uh, the Policy Committee has been churning way through that. And um, who's taking that one? Robert? Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the board, uh, this is uh, uh, the last chapter that we'll work on this year, and then starting uh, next uh, in January, then the committee will start on uh, Chapter 4. But Chapter 3, I'm going to try to walk you through it, 66, page 66 in your uh, board book. And uh, the changes are not earth-shattering, but there's some that need to be made and some that are made for convenience, moving uh, different policy uh, sections of policies to other policies. So just kind of bear with me. I'll walk through it fairly quickly. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to stop me. Uh, one of the things we did is we added a couple of positions on page 67, a couple, Part E and Part F, uh, relating to the uh, requirement that the superintendent annually evaluate each principal and to evaluate each school administrator assigned the responsibility for the school program. So uh, it's just really clarification that uh, employees have the right to be uh, evaluated and the superintendent is the person to do the evaluation for these particular people. Moving on, and I'm just going to keep talking unless somebody interrupts me. Uh, you'll see on page 68, and we do this a couple of places in our policy, we change the word school district administration to superintendent. Let me give you an example. It's the responsibility of the old policy, school district administration, to develop a school environment, on and on and on. Uh, we don't work with the rest of the student or the rest of the faculty. We work with the superintendent, and the superintendent is responsible to the board. And so the policy is being changed wherever it says school district administration to put in the word uh, superintendent in place and strike the word school district administration. We did add a fairly long section, 3.1, uh, the superintendent of schools, 3.12, superintendent selection, because of what this board is going to be going through. Uh, shortly. Uh, after the first of the year, uh, you, the board will be entering into a process for hiring of a, a permanent superintendent and uh, this outlines what the process will be and what the requirements will be uh, for, the, for the board, for the applicants, uh, etc. So again, you may want to take a little look at that. I think it's fairly complete, uh, but if you have any questions, let us know. And again, on all of these, we're going to be coming back with you, back to you next month, I believe, is, right. uh, for approval. So if you have any comments or any concerns, please uh, get a hold of myself and John and Vicki. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, moving on, going to page, if I can find it here, 74. This is where we're talking about early dismissal, late start, cancellation of school classes. What we did is we and, uh, put in some language relating to the flexible learning day. That's what we now use almost exclusively. There would probably be very minimal times that the school will actually be closed and no activities taking place, no educational activities. Uh, for snowstorms, for uh, any number of things, we use the flexible day so that education goes on. There's not a break. Uh, if there would be... Uh, I think the one that Dr. Olson used in committee is a good example. Uh, back when I was still with the MSBA, the governor closed uh, the school district. Uh, at the MSBA convention, he announced he was closing because of weather. Well, that would be an actual closing of the school district. So that would uh, also fall into this particular section. So uh, we put flexible learning days uh, issues in. Also, uh, more of a just an editing change than anything. We're going, we used to have what we called the District Emergency Action Plan. That's now going to be called the Crisis Management Plan, and that's been used throughout some of our documents for some time. Um, we talk about some of the crisis specific procedures that would be used under ALICE, and ALICE is for uh, those of you that may not be familiar with ALICE, it's a procedure that has uh, gained. Uh, movement nationally, and, and I've actually certified in this now, uh, and I think some of the other board members may also be certified. Um, it's, ALICE stands for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, Evacuate uh, Procedures for Each Building. 
and it's what our faculty and students are working with uh, as we prepare for what, something we hope we never use. Moving on, um, we talk about emergency contacts. Uh, it used to be emergency telephone numbers. Well, there's many ways of contacts now, so it's, a, it's more of an editing change than anything. The Security Committee is a new committee that came in, I believe it was last year. It's a committee that I serve on, and uh, it is uh, made up of uh, two police officers, uh, parents, uh, staff from the school, the principals are very involved, the superintendent of the schools in the past has shared that. I believe there may be a little bit of a change, and uh, that will be delegated to somebody else. But uh, this is the committee that uh, is not a board committee, but it is a committee that will be working with the school district and with the board to keep us informed of what we need to know about security, about enforcement, uh, how our, uh, our school uh, liaison officers, or officer now, soon to be officers, I believe, uh, how they're working, uh, some of the issues they're running into. So we want to get that into the policy uh, for uh, adoption by the board. Uh, moving on, let me see. If you, if, and I'm going to just jump all the way to the end. You'll see on page 82, um, let me see, can you remember what the, oh, this, this is, uh, we just changed, we took a, a whole list of issues that fell under uh, the Health and Safety Advisory Committee identified and and programs and, and, and plans and just said an applicable law. There's no need to, re, to continue every six months or every time the legislature meets or every time there's a court case or every time the governor or the department uh, do something with a plan to have to come back and change it. So this would have the, the, the uh, uh, policy and uh, uh, apply to applicable law. And if you get down to the budget, again, uh, we took a, a significant part of this out because it's practice rather than policy. Uh, this document should be school board policy, not school board procedures or district procedures. So we, we're suggesting it be eliminated. It doesn't change what's done. It just changes um, how we ad address it. And then if you get to animals in the classroom, and no, I'm not talking about Drew. I know you thought that, but it isn't. Uh, we're moving that to uh, Chapter 7, and so that'll be reviewed, be reviewed a little later on when the uh, uh, new committee gets to them in a year or so. And we're also doing the same thing with uh, uh, dep uh, deposition of uh, obsolete equipment. That's one we're re uh, taking out of the, uh, out of the uh, chapter and eliminating it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's again, it's state law, and it's... Uh, I'm sorry? It's being moved to Chapter 4. Is this one being yeah. one of them? Yeah, yeah. this is okay. being moved to Chapter 4. Like I said, this is being moved to Chapter 4. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's everything we have. And uh, again, please take a chance, uh, a few minutes to look at this and get back to one of the committee members or to Dr. Peterson. And we'll bring it back up before you for more discussion and a vote uh, in about a month. Anybody want to try and interrupt Bob now? <laughs> did a good job, John. Thank you. October 4th. That's our That's the policy next meeting, well, yep. meeting, and then we'll bring it back on October 21st to the board meeting. And the work of the committee is not done. We have some requirements that every year the board has to review. It's a fairly long list right. of policies. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we get down to Chapter 3, we'll be moving into those mandatory policies. Uh, bullying is a good example. Uh, we'll be moving into that, so uh, our work isn't done, and we'll be coming back to you again near the end of the year, uh, calendar year, so that uh, we can adopt those policies. Yeah, the other piece uh, that we'll be looking at would be any policies that reflect statutory changes from the last session, uh, case law, etc. That MSBA is uh, yeah. that list uh, just came sent to us. Yep. yep. Very good. Uh, last item we have for information tonight is our update on the summer academic programs that we fondly refer to as Read and Feed. Read and Feed. Oh my gosh, it seems like a long time ago it was uh, June 5th. A lot has happened since then. We had another great year at Read and Feed. 
and with our STARS Learning Program, so I'll share a little bit um, with you about that tonight. Um, as you may recall, our district, uh, our middle school site is eligible for a summer food program based on location. It is uh, located in a, in a it's in a location that um, it's based on areas of core economic conditions is what uh, the, the actual definition is by the state. Now just to give you a heads up, we will be up for re-eligibility this year. So we will need to be waiting until mid-year to see if that site continues to be eligible. And so 2020 is our year to find out. So I will certainly keep you posted on that. Um, but then this, we have been um, holding the read and feed since 2009. So that has been an, a great run. And the read and feed program provides breakfast and lunch to children ages one to 18. There are no income eligibility requirements. Adults can purchase meals as well. Our program this year ran from June 5th to August 9th. As you may recall, a couple years ago we extended it. We used to be a Monday through Thursday program and we extended it to Fridays and that's worked really well for us. Um, during the read and feed, we provide opportunities for kids to take books. We have book donations. We also have learning games and supervisors on site. So that seems to be going quite well. We partner with the city um, to provide transportation stops and I've included those locations in, in your um, information for tonight. You can see that we added a North Elementary stop and that's because last year um, North Elementary was eligible to have a read and feed site as well but then with the ceiling work that building wasn't open. So in order to accommodate the students that live in that area we provided a bus stop at North Elementary and that seemed to work quite well. We continue to have lots of ridership we had almost 1,600 riders this summer on um, St. Peter Transit, so that's been great. And then if you take a look just down at the bottom of your document there, you can see our trend, our numbers. And this year we served 11,800 meals, which averaged about 256 meals a day. When we started, you can look back and see we served thir about 3,900 meals. So what a great um, program to provide to the children in our community and the growth that we've seen has been has been wonderful. You can see that that's broken down in meals to serve to children and then to adults. So 10,880 meals were served to St. Peter kids this year. So that's a little bit about the read and feed. And then secondly, I'd like to report on the STARS Academy program, which um, kind of really goes hand in hand with the read and feed, as those students are participants in the read and feed when they're at STARS Academy. Because our district um, has an early, an, excuse me, an area learning center, we become eligible for targeted services, which allows us to provide after school programming and summer programming for students. Typically, we have about 125 students in grades K through six participating, and that was uh, the same this year. We held that program for four weeks, four days a week, four hours a day. Um, so we like to say it's four by four by four. And again, we served 126 students. Um, students become eligible for that program based upon test scores, uh, um, work in their classrooms, and recommended by te recommendations by their teachers. Parents, however, can opt in or out of that program um, for their students. Part of the requirement of our STARS Academy program is each teacher develops a continual learning program plan, excuse me, for the participants. They take a pre-assessment, they work on skills throughout the four weeks, and then they um, are assessed again at the end with a post-assessment. And out of our 126 students, 121 of those students made gains from the pre-assessment to the post-assessment, so that's 96%. Gains ranged from one to two points in some cases, but as I was going through those scores, there were also students with 40 to 50 point gains over that 40, that, those four weeks. Teachers did make note of that summer learning loss. So from the point school ended in May to the point this program started in July, there was a noticeable um, regression of skills for some students. So that program is, the goal of that program is just to get them back up before school starts again. You can also see there at each grade level how many students were uh, participated and then what their focus area was. Again, it's four hours a day. They hit it hard, um, but we need to be really um, focused, our, focus our efforts on what's, what they really want to um, work on at each of those grade levels. So any questions about either the Read and Feed or Summer Stars Academy? Really partner, great programs to partner. Uh, tell me about the recertification again and what the process is. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, is it something so, that we are worried about? Well, you know, um, 
and you know, I'm not an expert in that area. I know that MDE, it, the program is a USDA funded program. MDE determines eligibility based on some sort of census formula. And so be, once you're ineligible, you have a five year grace. So you can be eligible, that you can continue the program for five years after that. But this is the year they were very clear that we'll need to requalify again. And so it's nothing, there's nothing we can do necessarily. It's just based on uh, that, that um, information that they're gathering on the, the homes within a radius of that middle school site and their economic status. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. the, the nice <coughs> part for us is we have that safety net of North Elementary being eligible. So North Elementary just became eligible. So worst case scenario, North becomes our primary read and feed site. Now is that as optimal as that center of town site? In my opinion, no. We have lots of camps that come to the middle school, use the facilities, that type of thing. Um, it would be wonderful to have those two sites again. Um, but I will certainly keep you posted. And if there's anything I could do to change things um, with our eligibility or make sure that we are, I certainly will. That's a great question. So a little bit of the good news and the bad news. Good news is that if you have people improving their status financially, you have fewer who fall into the category mm -hmm. uh, of eligibility. So if you have a rising tide and people are doing better within the radius of this of that particular building, then you're you're in or out. So mm -hmm. it it's a program that you'd like to continue because of the success that it has, but it's not one where you want to jump up and down and say, oh great. Less than 50% of our kids are above the poverty line. Yay! Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we don't want to cheer that. We just really like to see this program mm -hmm. continue because it works. It does work. And, and this year, um, the high school summer programming was held at the middle school just for that reason in feeding kids. So we shifted everything to that site. It was really a hub um, because of um, you know, the, the high school site, the, the odds of that becoming eligible are quite low. So and I think the other thing that's overlooked a little bit too, ET, is that we feed, you know, between 900 and 1,000 adults mm -hmm. um, during that period of time as well. And they pay mm -hmm. uh, for what they're taking, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, it's, it's serving a wide mm -hmm. uh, range of our citizens. Yes, for sure. And, you know, adults bring their lunch, they come with their kids. A lot of adults feed their kids and then they go home and eat. Um, but we did. We do have our, you know, the folks that you see every day, and and so that's it's a great program. So can appreciate the continued support of the board for these programs. I, I do want to note too; these are both self-supporting programs. Um, the read and feed for every meal that is served to students, we are reimbursed, and that covers the cost of the program. And then for our Stars Academy program, that's through our ALC, as I mentioned before, and all, and we receive funding for seat hours in that program as well. So they're self-supporting programs. And just as a, just something to mention, we will be going through a recertification project for our ALC as mm -hmm. well this year. Um, and it's just making sure that uh, we have all of the components in place that we need to have uh, to qualify for it as an ALC. And we mm -hmm. do. We do, yep. Yeah, so wonderful. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right, that gets us through our information items we had this evening and into reports. And as usual, we start with the principals. We have several weeks of school under their belt now. <laughs> creatures of habit at all. Yeah. So, all right, so take my read and feed hat off, put on my early childhood administrator hat. Um, so this is week three for preschoolers at, at the Early Learning Center and things are hopping. There's nothing better than seeing three, four and five year olds come off those buses and be ready to go with their new, usually it's called a pack pack on their back. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they are ready to go and they're about this big, some of them. So if you ever have a chance to stop up and watch that, it's wonderful. Like I said, uh, week three, 
really focused on routines and safety right now and so we'll have the buses coming next week and we'll practice sitting and getting on and off the bus and listening to Mr. Paul and Mr. Don which is super important. Um, we do still have openings for our three and four year olds so if there are families out there who are still looking for a preschool option most of them are in the afternoon but we, still, we would encourage um, them to call our office um, and then we're also preparing already for our first um, early childhood screening. Dr. Olson mentioned that earlier. Early childhood screening is required by law and it is one of the, um, it is our, our function that results in the most referrals for early childhood special education. And so we really encourage families to have their children come in and it's a screening and um, so that we can make sure that they're on track developmentally. And so that's October 3rd, so we look forward to that. And moving on up to South Elementary, we too have had just had a fantastic start. It has gone so smoothly and I really do credit that to the staff that is there. They take great care of kids and parents and um, it is just amazing to watch that transformation from the first day of school when they get off with their backpacks <laughs> and they want breakfast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we can just continue on. But they just, um, they fall into that routine so easily and, and it's not an easy task, but they've done a fab fabulous job with that. Um, kudos too to the uh, Friends of Learning who provided numerous students backpacks. I believe all total there were about um, 500, I mean, five to six. Yeah, and it's just, it's a tremendous program so that when they come to school, they're coming with all the supplies. They, they purchase the items um, specific to each school site um, and, and those students walk in with the same supplies as everyone else and it's just, it's a, it's a really, really um, wonderful um, service project that we have in our community. So thank you to the entire committee and the, the Lions Club who um, spearheads that. And we also had the Elks Club from Mankato who has provided about eight or nine backpacks stuffed with, again, supplies for our students. So um, that whole it takes a village to send kids to school definitely resonates in the halls of South. Um, we have completed our FAST assessments this week. That's just a little bit of an overview so that we can get an idea of where students are at and it gives us some idea on where to start with instruction. So we're happy to say that that process is done. and. And with the additions of the iPads, we've, we've now transitioned, most of our students are doing those on iPads because the students are not familiar with using a mouse anymore. It's iPads, they come in and they're familiar with phones and, and iPad um, usage. So um, we, have, we have almost fully trans, uh, you know, transferred um, doing that assessment on the iPad and it's been great. Last Monday, we had our first parent council meeting uh, we had a really great crowd and Laura Zender, who is our new elementary counselor, presented on establish, establishing school routines and um, dealing with anxieties with, with students. So um, there's that fine line, I think, when you have a five-year-old that's anxious about school, is it a problem or is this just normal anxiety? So she did a great job of kind of setting some minds at ease. And an invitation stands to all of you for this Friday, or excuse me, Thursday evening, um, the best meal deal in town. You can come to the South Playground. It's Playground Night. And again, it's sponsored by our parent council. Um, there'll be a meal that will be served by the FFA. We partner with them and they'll be bringing things in. A dollar Culver snack, you can't beat that. Um, and we know how to throw a party and we throw it from five to 6.30. So, um, and the best part is they enjoy rolling down the hill. We have all the playground equipment, all the toys out, but you'll see a number the of them. Just, the the, the, the yeah. students. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen many parents doing it. So, um, and it looks like the weather is going to hold out for us. So it should be another great night itself. Before or after the snacks? <laughs> <laughs> it's up to them. <laughs> Depends on what mom it is. Well, greetings from North Elementary, um, where I just want to echo what uh, BT even Doreen talked about. Just. Uh, thanks for all the teachers, um, support the staff. Uh, we've had a number of leadership team meetings at North in our first three weeks, and uh, the overall theme for those leaders from uh, those team, those teachers that have served on those teams were like, it was the best start of the school year they can remember, and some of them have 20 plus years of experience, which is pretty impressive. Um, and that just, just goes to all of those teachers and staff members um, and the communication that they put out there and just so much caring including the community as well. Like Doreen said, um, 
just with backpack supplies and food, um, you know, weekend food programs and stuff like that. Just everybody's ready to serve. Um, that's just one of the many elements that make St. Peter just a phenomenal um, education community in general, but certainly like supporting our educational institutions as much as they possibly can. Um, North has, has definitely been in uh, full full speed. Um, we've I guess we've shifted over from the pack packs to the backpacks. I haven't <laughs> I haven't heard of the pack pack yet, but they they're getting it down definitely by second grade. I was thinking we'd have a, a little bit more room at North. We kind of um, sent a pretty large fourth grade class up to fifth grade at the middle school, but we're actually at the exact same number. I was looking at looking at some student numbers on my board today, and we're we're still up one from last year. So. Um, definitely our numbers are right there, 477 I had on my count with fourth grade at about 167. Uh, so that's a pretty good number of students in there. Uh, and I, uh, I make the rounds that first week and just try, I meet with every homeroom and uh, welcome them back. And I always like to give the, the talk to the fourth graders. They're, they're the seniors on campus now, you know. Second and third graders are looking up to them and watching them and they definitely kind of puff up their chest a little bit. <laughs> that's right, I am. <laughs> but they're, they're ready to roll. Uh, we had our uh, PBS team at our, our first assembly, which our first theme is always building a culture for learning. Um, the teachers do a really nice job like sending that same message in the classroom, but then we celebrate as a whole group of you know, 477 students and all the staff members hearing all the same thing at the same time. Uh, one, of the, one of the new elements the PBS team put in um, uh, has a little more focus on, on staff. They, they wanted to practice the, um, like the culture of being um, thankful. And so every Thursday, the team just sends out a Google form, and it's just called Thursday, Thankful Thursday. Um, and there's about 80 staff members and all at North, and I would say like 40 of them every week have submitted, I mean, this big, long list. Um, there definitely has somebody that's risen to the top with a lot of thanks. And it's, uh, it's I, got, I have to give a shout out for Mr. Nick in the cafeteria. That guy is phenomenal, and he makes the best pizzas on Friday. <laughs> so he, he, He's, not that I'm competitive at all, but he has quite a few thanks in that lineup. <laughs> He's, so, yeah, just one example of many people to be thankful for. Um, you know, as during, we've been talking about the new math and reading curriculum, that's a super heavy load um, for our uh, four through, our kindergarten to fourth grade teachers, and they are taking it in stride. Of course, it's, it's a challenge, you know, efficiency level goes down a little bit, but they're leaning on each other as a team to ask each other questions and how, you, how are we getting through this. Um, I've had um, at least three teachers come up to me and say, you know, Mr. Doherty, I've, I've had some students come up to me and say, this is the first year as a fourth grader that they really feel like they know what's going on and enjoy math. And that has a lot to do with how that instruction is taking place, for example, in math. Um, it's, a di it's a different rollout. It requires thinking and patterning and conversations with their peers. Um, and so that's just, I think, one of the elements that we're going to see district or K-8 wide as, as uh, students are exposed to this new curriculum. Um, and the teacher, like I said, teachers are doing a phenomenal job uh, with that as they move forward. And how's the playground? Oh, yeah, the playground is good. We have new lines. We, the big deal right now is we have, we have some uh, free throw lines on the basketball court, which we've never had before. So a lot of kids playing basketball. Um, and I am going to work with a gr small group of fourth graders on Friday, weather permitting. We're going to try to uh, mark, paint the field, a football field and a soccer field. Um, but, we, but of course, math teacher, in my background, I, I need to show them Pythagorean theorem so we can figure out a 90 degree corner out in the middle of that space. <laughs> so I'm going to force them into a math, about a 15 minute math lesson before we get out there and do that 80 by 40 yard field. Just paint the field, coach. <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> this needs to be square. So looking forward to that. But yeah, the playground is, is uh, yeah, the swings are super popular. Like the kids are out there all the time. And um, Gaga Ball <laughs> continues to be very popular. So. <laughs> Theorem. <laughs> ah, so at the middle school, uh, as you know, we're moving into year three, uh, and as such, you know, we're uh, constantly in this state of, of this heightened state of monitor and adjust as this new organization. And one of the things that we've been monitoring for the last couple of years has been our schedule. Uh, if you remember, we functioned with an eight-period day, which equated to 42-minute class periods, um, and the overall sense of that schedule was just this feeling of being rushed. Uh, it decreased our ability to build relationships, it decreased our ability to deliver, you know, meaningful, engaging uh, instruction, uh, and just really added to that idea of assembly line education, which we're really trying to get away from uh, in America. So uh, this year we opened with a four-block A 
B day schedule um, with the intent of just slowing the world down. Um, it improves our ability to build relationships, improves our ability to deliver meaningful instruction, improves um, our ability to differentiate within that classroom because you have more time, and it decreases the amount of transition time that our kids have. Uh, we're in week three, and overall the, the feeling is very, very positive from both staff and students. Students uh, report less homework or being able to stay on top of their, their assignments more. Um, they report less feeling rushed or less stress. Uh, one student said, I hate it, Mr. Graff. And I said, why do you hate it? And he said, because they're making me think, man. Uh, so to me, that's, that's positive. That's very positive. Uh, and staff has really uh, expressed just a feeling of calm and, and positive atmosphere uh, just with the culture uh, because of just slowing the world down. Um, so overall, uh, it's been a good move so far. You know, and anything new, we're not perfect at it. Uh, we will support the heck out of our teachers and our students in, in getting used to that um, and continue to solicit feedback from students, staff, and the community as we go. Well, at the high school, I feel like we, we never left. Um, we're, in, we're in week four. Uh, next week is midterm already. Wednesday the 25th, I believe, is, is already midterm. So we're, <laughs> we're just full steam ahead. No time for pack packs and no <laughs> drawing lines on the field. Um, our, we have our first uh, parent-teacher conference coming up next Monday. Uh, and those are, you, uh, you have the ability to schedule those with specific teachers uh, that you're interested in visiting with. Um, and it just a, I've, I've been up here a lot tonight, so I did a couple things I want to highlight. Last week, um, our egg instructors hosted their region, um, all of the region egg instructors, and there were about 40, there must have been at least 40 to 50 uh, teachers that were touring the facility. Uh, Mr. Reeser cooked them some smoked brisket on his homemade Ooh. smoker that he may or may not keep out back, um, <laughs> but it, it was just a really, it was a really great night, um, and and people were really impressed with with the facility. Um, and then one other plug: uh, next Saturday, this coming Saturday, the 21st, uh, we're hosting a classic car roll-in for Landon, um, and any any of the money that comes in from that will go into a scholarship in his name. So we're hoping for good weather. Questions for anybody? Dr. Olson. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I just really, uh, as, as all of you are aware, at the board table, we're, uh, we're uh, awash in negotiations. Uh, we're, the negotiations process has started with our office support folks, our custodial group, our paraprofessional group, and upcoming with our teachers. So uh, that negotiations process is going on. In addition, I'm participating in the negotiations process with the Minnesota Valley Education District, um, and we're starting with their teacher group actually tomorrow evening. Uh, also, just to uh, mention, uh, we're, as you know, working with the City of St. Peter <coughs> to help conduct our upcoming school board election. That process is going well. Uh, from the superintendent search standpoint, we have a workshop scheduled for November 12th with the Minnesota School Boards Association. Uh, Sandy Dunlock and others titled Hiring the Right Superintendent. So we're looking forward to that. And then uh, I just want to echo the... Before you leave that, um, I think it's your intent or our intent to invite the... Newly elected. The newly elected. Uh, absolutely. Uh, even though they don't take office until January, they'll... Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly the process. Uh, the, the other thing I just want to echo is it's, it's been exciting and, and fun and energizing to be back uh, on board watching all of the people work to bring quality education to the students of St. Peter. So, um, and as I always like to mention to everybody, I have a vested interest, seven grandkids in the system between first grade and a senior, so um, I'm watching carefully. <laughs> and I like what I see. There are good things going on. So. Thank you, sir. Um, board members, nope. anything that we haven't, Tim? You know what? <clears throat> I have something. I just want to acknowledge that I think it's exciting because there's a lot of candidates out in the crowd tonight that are running for school board and it's exciting to see a community have 10 candidates on the ballot for four spots because I think there's an awful lot of communities out there that are struggling to find them and that says a lot to 
St. Peter, the community, and the education system. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. Thanks for being here. Yep. Thanks for running. Mm -hmm. Robert? You're done. I'm done. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> no. True? No, thank you. Ken? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> um, upcoming meetings of the school board. We have scheduled uh, study session Monday, September 30th at the Middle School Media Center at 6.30. Policy review October the 4th, Friday at 7 a.m. in the district office. Regular board meeting is Monday, October 21 here, 6.30. And there will also be an announcement going out for a special meeting scheduled for special board meeting scheduled for September 25th, 7 a.m. in the district office. He's ready. They're all special. Scheduled. Yeah. <laughs> Which <laughs> brings us to our favorite agenda item to the lady on my left. I make a mo motion to adjourn. Second. And a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Mr. Doherty, do you use a three, four, five triangle on the corner? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Come on.